it's a kick in the pants. It's fast. The speed is just incredible. The fastest go-karts in America don't run in Florida or North Carolina. You won't find them in other racing hotbeds like Texas or California. They're right here in our backyard at Summit Point Kart in Summit Point, West Virginia, 20 minutes outside of Winchester. Summit Point offers the fastest go-karting in the universe. The seriousness of our racing uh, is paramount. It's not anything like uh, what you would find at, uh, you know, Funland or something where, you know, cotton candy and flip-flops are, are the norm. Jens Scott is the general manager at Summit Point Kart, a go-kart facility whose mission is to make real, fast, heart-pounding racing accessible to anyone who wants to try it. You can pretty much show up with absolutely nothing and be in a kart and learn exactly what it's like to be out on a track. I always had a passion for racing and I thought about this place uh, about a year ago. I was a rookie uh, last year and uh, this year I pretty much spent here every weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Here's how Summit Point Kart works. New drivers take part in Arrive and Drive. 25 bucks gets you a kart, a helmet and a racing suit. After a brief safety video, you get one 11 minute session on the half mile 11 turn track. The track also offers leagues for adults and kids, but if you're new to karting, Arrive and Drive Friday through Sunday is for you. This is the only out outdoor track anywhere in the area as far as concession carts to arrive and drive. Pay your money, get in the cart, have fun. There are two types of carts at Summit Point, the RX-7 and the RX-250. The RX-7 is the cart you race when you arrive and drive, top speed and impressive 55 miles an hour. The RX-250, those are the fastest carts in the country with the capability of hitting 80 miles an hour. In order to drive an RX-250, racers have to meet a strict qualifying time on the track. The 250s, they're for the more experienced carters. The Sodi RX-250 and the RX-7 um, blow the doors off of every other uh, concession go-karting place there is. Can you just describe to me what, what that ride is like? It's a different feeling. This is the car that really has an acceleration, so you can play with your throttle also. Uh, it's, it's fast. <laughs> has brakes too, so. <laughs> so after hearing all those rave reviews, you know I had to try it for myself. First, I had to gear up. You gotta put this chest protector on here. So it protects you from uh, the steering wheel if you get ejected. <laughs> this is not a one-man job, I don't think. Oh boy, it's snug. <laughs> the great thing about Summit Point Kart is that anybody can race out here, either the avid carter or a novice like myself. So what do you say we head out to the track? Hang on. Now we're good. <laughs> The last piece of gear was a head cover and a helmet. Mine was fixed with a camera on top, recording my trip around the track. First, I test drove an RX-7. I've done karting before, but only at those cotton candy and flip-flop places Jens talked about earlier. I had never experienced anything like this. It took a few laps to get adjusted to the sensitivity of the brakes and grip of the tires. But when I did, I was a force to be reckoned with. Well, kind of. In the interest of being a good journalist and getting the whole story, I let the guys talk me into a few laps in the RX-250. It didn't take much convincing. As impressive as the RX-7 was, the 250 was on an entirely different level. Accelerating down the backstretch was like taking off in a rocket ship. Thankfully, Patrick was right about these things having brakes. There's a lot of reasons I love fly fishing. It gets you outside. That's the easiest answer. Is it's a great way to kind of get out and connect with nature. And at the end of the day, fly fishing takes you to beautiful places. This is what you do if you're all by yourself. It's a, it's a great way to, to see the world. That's Brian Tro, co-owner of Mossy Creek Fly Fishing in Harrisonburg. For an afternoon last week, Brian was my teacher as I took the store's beginner class in fly fishing. There's no end to the variety. You can't perfect fly fishing. I mean, some of the best fly fishermen in the world are in their 70s and 80s, and it's because it takes a lifetime to kind of like uh, accumulate all the knowledge about bugs and stream conditions. But I only had an afternoon, which for Brian and the rest of the instructors at Mossy Creek was more than enough time to take me from newbie to casting a hook in the water. Oh, this is so frustrating. You almost got it. Take your time. The fish aren't going anywhere, right? A half-day class lasts for about four and a half hours. Step one, a classroom session at the store in Harrisonburg. This knot is called the improved clinch knot. Okay. Okay. 
and you're going to kind of hold the tag into the line and you're going to turn the fly seven times. The first part of the curriculum, learning about the equipment, rods, reels, all the different kinds of lines. The first hands-on task is tying the three most essential knots in fly fishing. Pull on the other pieces of string, slowly, boom, you got it, man. Beautiful blood knot. Check it out, look at it. You can let go. Perfect blood knot. Success. For Brian, who's been fly fishing his whole life, the knots were a snap. For me, who wore Velcro shoes until I was 12, it was a bit tougher. I eventually got the hang of all three, and besides, in fly fishing, knowing how to tie a knot is crucial. You hook into something that you've really been working towards, the biggest trout of your life, and it fails because you didn't take one extra second to tighten your knot, sure. and you're going to be, I see it, it's like heartbreak. It's like you lost your puppy dog, you know? After the knots, we moved on to the flies. In fly fishing, they're the bait. There are literally thousands to choose from, and it turns out fish can be pretty picky. If you lived in a eight by eight cabin for five years, you would be very aware of every little thing that goes on in it, okay? Right. That's their little world. It's everything that floats through. So as the bugs come and go, they can get very tuned into that. They can be opportunistic and they can eat anything that you put on some days. Right. Other days it's like they're eating one size, one shade, mm. one shape, one shade of color of one fly. And it's your job as the angler to figure that out. Depending on water conditions, fish eat flies both on top of and below the surface. In order to learn how to fish both techniques, we brought a few of each to the stream. Which brings us to part two of Brian's beginner class, a short drive to a private stream 15 minutes north of Harrisonburg to learn the art of fly casting. So that's where we're going to start. The cast, like most things in fly fishing, can take a lifetime to perfect, but a basic understanding can also be taught in around an hour. I got my first lesson in an open field without a hook on the line. One of the hardest things about fly casting is everything that you've learned to do from throwing a football to throwing a spinning rod to throwing anything or swinging a club, everything's done in like the forward motion. With a fly cast, if you want it 30 feet out there on the water, you have to throw it 30 feet back there behind you, which means your back cast, what happens behind you, has to be equal and even to what happens in front of you. That's where the back and forth motion comes in. Keeping the line in the air, momentum is generated, providing the speed to eventually send the fly forward into the water. Good. Gradually, more techniques are introduced. Pick your spot and stop and drop. Beautiful. You stop, mm -hmm. let it fall. Got you it. got a good cast, man. Cool, I'm man. serious. Like, All right, I like a it. really good cast. And with that vote of confidence and about an hour of casting practice, I was ready to hit the water. Well, my mom used to play professionally, and she put on a clinic for kids when I was 10 years old, and I asked her if I could join, and she said sure, and that's kind of the beginning where it all started. About 10 years ago, Kaylani Bailey took up the family trade racquetball, and today she's one of the best female players in the country. I cut the ball off a lot, really aggressive, do a lot of short hopping, um, and a lot of other women, especially my age, girls, they don't, they don't do that. They like, like to wait for the ball. And I just like go ahead and just hit it out of the air and be really aggressive and take people by surprise. Surprise is a good way to describe Kaylani's field hockey teammates last fall at Shenandoah when they learned that the new freshman forward was nationally ranked in racquetball and just three years ago had never even heard of field hockey. It's just something different. I feel like my whole family's played racquetball and I love playing racquetball. It's great. Um, but, you know, field hockey, I kind of found, like, it's my sport, you know, it's kind of something that, like, I'm proud of, like, I found this sport, so I'm going to keep playing it. And the Hornets are happy to have her. There are plenty of similarities between racquetball and field hockey, and that's something new head coach Ashley Smeltzer noticed right away. I think the biggest thing is hand-eye coordination and then footwork as well. I know, or I'm assuming that in racquetball, you know, footwork is key, and, and for field hockey it certainly is as well. So those are probably the two biggest things. Despite her newfound passion for field hockey, Bailey still competes in racquetball. And this March, she made Shenandoah proud at the National College Tournament. Technically, Shenandoah does have a national title now. Yeah, you heard that right. Bailey went to Arizona State, played in the top bracket with the best college-age players in the country, and won the championship as a freshman on a very hostile court. I knew I could beat her, but I knew it would be a good good match, especially like on her home courts and all the fans like are there for her and they have the little signs and stuff. And then I don't have anybody from Shenandoah. I was there by myself. So what's next for Kaylani Bailey? Field hockey starts in August and she still practices racquetball at Stonebrook Club in Winchester. After graduation, she'll turn pro if she wants to. But before all that, she's got to play me. I know never to underestimate your opponent, so. Sounds good. You can take it easy on me. Uh, do you want me to play left-handed? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. It's on now. <laughs>
twist bracket ball. One game, first to 15 points wins. Rock, paper, scissor for serve. Kehlani won that, and that was not a good sign for me. Final score, Kehlani 15, me 0. With the reigning national champ, Matt Estrich, TV3 Winchester Sports. In part one of Gone Fishing, I took the beginner class at Mossy Creek Fly Fishing in Harrisonburg. Store owner Brian Tro's lesson started in the classroom where the basics of the sport were taught. Equipment, Slowly. knot tying, and learning about the different types of flies. And you will find a woolly bugger. From there, we moved outside to learn how to cast. After about an hour or so, I had a pretty good understanding of the technique and what Brian assured me was enough skill to hit the water. If you're looking for a reason to get outdoors and you know just hiking doesn't appeal to you or just canoeing, um, fly fishing is a great angle and a great way to go about it. Uh, you get to interact with nature. It takes you to beautiful places. Beautiful places like Smith Creek on Suzy Q Farm, about five minutes south of Newmarket. It's a fly fishing only, catch and release only creek. It didn't take us long to find what we came for. We've already seen a couple of huge fish, yeah. just so you know. Brian took the rod first. He wanted to take a few casts to show me how to put it all together on the stream. On just his second cast, we got a sign that we were in for a good day. Here comes trout, here comes trout, ready? Rod tip up. See? Watch closely what I'm doing. See, I keep my rod as high as I can. Uh -huh. When he fights hard, I let some line go. When he slows down, I'm gonna gain. It's a tug of war, right? Mm -hmm. let, him, let him run and then gain. Let him run and then gain. You can see his body language. You're, she, you're trying to tire him out, right? Yeah. She's slowing down some, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you do if you're all by yourself. It's <laughs> <laughs> so just that easy, right? See how easy it is? Brian getting one that easily was a huge confidence booster. Now it was my turn. We started with a dry fly. That's a fly that sits on top of the water. Nice cast, man. That's, that's where you call yours. Man. This is the money spot right here. It didn't take long for me to get some nibbles, or as they say in fly fishing, get eaten. Good. Oh, he went over it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, throw it back out to him. Strip, strip, set, set, rod tip up. Ooh, fish. I had him, I had him, I had him. The key to landing a fish is once you get eaten, to pull on the rod to set the hook. Set, 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 set. He ate you twice. Oh. Lay it back down. Otherwise, the fish will realize the fly is phony and just spit it out. Another consideration is knowing when to move from one spot to the other. Fish can get spooked from all the commotion in the stream, especially when a clumsy beginner is fishing. We switched up our spot about every 10 to 15 minutes. After about an hour or so, with so many close calls, we tried one last spot, a shady bend in the stream underneath trees that required a sidearm cast from our knees. You're going to creep up here with me. Get low and come right over here on my right side. We're actually going to stay down. Big fish. This spot was promising, but the close calls kept coming. Set, 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 set. Not tip up. Oh, had him. Had him. Had him. <laughs> oh. So what you're, what's happening here is this. They're a little bit spooky, but they're getting each other excited. Then with our day coming to a close. Set, 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 set. Rod tip up. He's a big fish. Keep your rod high. Keep your rod high. OK, rod's high. OK, let him run. Run, 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 okay. run, run, run. Come on, real. Give him let go with your left hand. Okay? I finally got my fish. Real, 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 real. My mm -hmm. rainbow trout put up quite a fight. This fish is not even close to being ready. Okay. It's a nice trout. It took about two minutes to finally me. reel her into shore. Boom. Success. But once we got her on the bank, I knew that fly fishing had me hooked. <laughs> All right, man. Nice. That's what I was talking about. This fish is huge. Brian measured my trout at 19 inches and a little over three pounds. After the picture, we got her back into the water as soon as possible. Not bad for a single day's lesson. From novice to fish in right around five hours. Plus, no need to tell a fisherman's tale for my friends back home. It's not lying when it's fishing. It's embellishing, you know. So, um, I, but I'll be honest with you, to, to catch that uh, on your first day, uh, you're, you might as well just not even go ever again. You're, you're done. You're done. <laughs> that was awesome.